I genuinely looked him right in the eye and I, I, you know, I try and be professional all the time and I just said, what the f dude? Recently I was injured and if you saw that video, you'll know I, I was pretty embarrassed that I got hurt. As somebody who educates people about safety on YouTube who has a shop, I never thought it could happen to me. But the truth of the matter is, uh, as people who work with our hands, at some point in our career, we're gonna have an injury. It may be minor, it may be major, you may have an amputation, but nobody talks about what to do to prepare for the worst case scenario. And I love to say, prepare for the worst, but hope for the best. I know that you and I never are gonna say I had the smartest injury today, but accidents happen. So I wanted to find out what to do in the event of a trauma, but I didn't wanna just kind of guess. So. We talked to actual viewers of this channel, people with shops who also happen to work in the trauma department of hospitals all over the United States. I got a chance to talk to a paramedic, the people who are first on scene to help you in the event of emergency. I got to talk to a physician's assistant who is in the ER, in the trauma department, doing just some of the most amazing work alongside doctors in every step of the process. I got to talk to a trauma surgeon uh, who was able to give me some really incredible information about amputations and how to really best improve your chances on saving your body parts if they do come off. We're gonna talk about what you need to have in your shop to be prepared for major and minor traumas. And we're gonna talk about some basic tips and tricks for first aid, some things that I learned uh, over the course of the, this process about you know, how to just fix some minor stuff in the shop that are uh, annoyances to all of us. Like I said in my previous video, which is linked here about my thumb injury, I, I didn't know what to do. So let's talk to some really great guys uh, about what to do in the event of a trauma. Guys, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here. If you wouldn't mind introducing yourself for my audience and what you do for a living. All right. My name is Cormac O'Brien. I'm a paramedic in Santa Barbara County. I've worked in emergency medicine since Gosh, 2002-ish and lots of different aspects. I'm also one of the instructors at the local community college for the EMT course. So my name is John Kodowski. I am a physician assistant working at a level one trauma center in San Antonio, Texas. I do orthopedic trauma. So I work in the emergency room, in the operating room, clinic, and in the inpatient side as well. I've been a physician assistant for 20 years, always working in a level one trauma center, always dealing with the big bad stuff. I, I work in um, uh, clinical academics, which means I also do a significant amount of teaching. I teach in the hospital at bedside. I also do classroom teaching, precepting. Uh, I teach PA students, med students, nurses, nursing students. I am also a very avid woodworker. I'm a hobbyist, so I make everything from cutting boards and clipboards and picture frames all the way up to big tables and buffet stands and everything in between. My name is James Learned. I'm an orthopedic trauma surgeon at UC Irvine in Orange County. As an orthopedic trauma surgeon, we sort of get anything that involves a broken bone or a dislocated joint. That includes sharp injuries from lathes, saws, food service equipment. So anything that's sharp and can, can hurt you, we get it. So as you can tell, these guys are on the front line of trauma treatment. Not only do they have shops, but they've seen it all over their years and years of experience. One of the things that they talked about was that was so important is being prepared. It's before you ever get injured. And they had some really interesting thoughts on that subject. The first thing that I'll say is the, the best way to keep yourself calm is to be prepared for something bad happening, quite honestly. And if you already sort of have at least a tentative plan and the awareness that an accident can happen in the shop at any time and take steps to make sure that if that should ever happen, you have access to a fire extinguisher, a first aid kit, a cell phone to call for help, simple things like that are able to kind of keep you focused and keep your head in the game, so to speak. If you feel completely helpless at the time of injury, you're only going to panic more as you try and figure out what you need to do. The lesson is if you don't have your kit, <laughs> you're kind of useless. Well, and I think, you know, especially when when it's someone who's a hobby woodworker and, you know, they got to move this tool out of the way to set up the next one. It's really easy to, you know, well, I'll remember to step over the extension cord or I'll remember to lift my hand up, but I can't find the blade guard and I just don't wanna go, I don't wanna waste time. Bad things happen when we're rushing and you only get lucky so many times. So take the time to do it right. You know, we spend so much time setting up our cuts to be precise and to, you know, mark it well and, and make sure that we're not gonna waste a piece of wood. 
but you can buy another piece of wood. So the best way to treat an injury is preparation beforehand. I mean, all that energy that we spend in, you know, preventing and safety equipment, I mean, even all that time we spend setting up our tools, we should put a little bit of energy into making sure our first aid kit is full and we know how to use it. John, I know being in San Antonio uh, and Texas, from my own analytics, there's a ton of woodworkers. What are some of the most common shop injuries that you see? For me, the most common thing that we see is falls. And from a variety of ways, we have high energy, we have low energy falls. Whenever we're working and we're moving around our shop, we have to make sure that we keep our pathways clear and our walkways clear. The second most common injury that I see in the emergency room uh, and with trauma is from circular saws. They're not taking the time to go and put that piece of wood onto a sawhorse, making sure that the deck of the circular saw is appropriately flat on the piece of wood and then sawing through. They're putting it over their bucket, uh, the tailgate of their truck, across their leg in many instances, whatever they can do to just keep moving and to keep the job going as quickly as they can. And without having the deck of that circular saw appropriately placed on the board, you're, lit, you're asking for kickback. Once we have that kickback, it can lead to very large lacerations. It can lead to lacerating muscle bellies. It can lead to uh, lacerating arteries, nerves, and veins. Even if you hit your forearm, the bones in your forearm are not very deep. A circular saw will absolutely reach the bones inside of your forearm, of course, your hand, and even your thigh if you try hard enough. Another common cause of injury that takes people to the emergency room is the miter saw. We have them on job sites and we have them in our shops. I have one right over here on my left shoulder. Part of the problem that we run into even in our own shop is using a piece that is entirely all too small and is not supported on both sides of the fence. So whenever you have that small piece that's only uh, supported on one side of the fence, it just makes it so that the blade as it's rotating back and away from you is pulling that piece in, which means that it can very easily pull your hand in. As many of us don't use the stops that support that piece and keep our hands away from the blade itself. Jointer injuries are not that common. Again, because I think people just sort of take a second and they see that spinning set of knives or helical head or whatever it is, as soon as that, that chop gets out of the way, that blade is fully exposed and that should be enough for everyone just to take pause a moment and realize where their hands are in relation to that and have that inherent healthy fear before they push that work piece across. Bandsaw injuries are something that we see occasionally as well. Mostly where people hurt themselves is whenever they're trying to put a piece through that's unsupported again, like round. Putting something round through a bandsaw is very dangerous. But the other thing that we always also have to keep in mind is exposed blades. Uh, things like handheld planers, routers. Um, we have these pieces here and that bit or that blade is spinning underneath of that. And it's very, very easy for us to try to hold the piece with one hand while we're using the tool with the other. We've all had a trim router that has just grabbed and ran down a piece of wood for at least a foot or so before we've even realized what was happening. Handheld planers, we're trying to keep that nice and level so that we get that smooth edge as we go across. And we're trying to use our non-dominant hand to perhaps keep it balanced or keep it flush or keep it smooth, whatever it needs to be. And the finger just slides right under there. Yeah, I know. Most of us woodworkers have that scar on our non-dominant hand from supporting a piece of material on the wrong side of the sharp metal thing. It's so common, it's almost a rite of passage. You know, one of the things when I had my injury was I really just didn't have my wits about me and that really is a physiological thing. Uh, guys, can you talk a little bit about what happens to the body when you have a trauma? Your body immediately releases different chemicals and uh, you're gonna get epinephrine or adrenaline going. So your heart's gonna start racing. You're sort of gonna not be able to really focus. And that's really important because it helps your body deal with these super stressful moments. But it also means that we're not really good at thinking clearly. We all kind of turn into scared animals. The first thing we need to do is to keep ourselves calm and centered. That sure sounds easy as we all sit here in the comfort of our own homes or shops or wherever you are right now, not immediately post accident. That's why the preparation comes into play. And what we have to do is to try and keep our head in the game and remember what we have done up to this point so that we can take care of ourselves. If you know how to check your own vital signs, you're gonna see after initial incident, your heart rate's gonna spike up. And if it continues to, to stay spiked, you know, a good time after the fight or flight or the adrenaline response wears off, then you're gonna 
up to maybe you know start questioning am i actually having a bigger issue here that was one of the things i struggled with when i had my injuries i wanted my brain to work and it just wouldn't i really liked that all of you talked about checking your own pulse uh, you know i think it's a task that is that takes your mind off of what just happened and it gives you some things to do that help you calm down like take a deep breath try and lower your pulse. You know, Cormac, you had a really good point about securing the scene. You know, as a paramedic for 20 years, I'm sure that you've encountered some really interesting situations when you're first to a trauma. That is one of the most paramount and important lessons before you go rushing in. Because if you rush in and you too become a victim of an, you know, a changing circumstance, then all of a sudden another ambulance is going to need to come pick you up and you just delayed care for the initial victim, if you will. So that is so, so important, especially in kind of industrial accidents. You don't want to just run right up to someone who's down and you don't know the situation. They could be sitting on some live wires or whatnot, and then you two could be electrocuted. If it's any type of chemical exposure. If you know multiple people are leaving a building and they're all throwing up, you might not want to just rush right in there first. You might want to get the hazmat guys out and get their detectors looking for you know methyl, ethyl, bad stuff. Yeah, that's a really good point. You want to make sure all the tools are off and any hazards are gone. That way anybody who's coming to help you or may enter the shop while you're gone can be safe. So now that we have calmed ourselves down and secured the scene, how do we assess what happened to us and what do we do next? Now that the injury has occurred, now that we have regained focus and we have regained control of ourselves, now we have to assess our injury, figure out how bad is it? And the first thing that I will tell you is if you feel like you need to seek care, then seek care. Whatever your gut tells you that you need to do is what you need to do. Don't try and minimize your symptoms and, and try and take care of things yourself and just sort of, you know, wrap a shop rag and some electrical tape around whatever's hurting you and keep going. Really try and think objectively and make a clear plan as to what it, this is and what I need to do. If you're alone or if you have people to help you, but if you do have like a, a large wound on your hands and it's bleeding profusely or even an amputation, obviously you want to call 911. You're going to need some further help. If we have a laceration, how bad is it? Is it actively bleeding? If it's a cut to one of your arteries, it's usually going to bleed in what we call a pulsatile fashion. So every time your heart beats, there's more pressure in the artery. And so it's going to squirt more blood. And depending on what your blood pressure runs, that might be squirt out of the wound. That might be squirt across the room. If you have blood that's shooting 20 feet across the room, that's arterial. If you have blood that is the color of the woodpeckers, uh, uh, square that I have behind me, that very well may be arterial. If you have blood that is the color of your jet clamps, that's a darker red, that's going to mean that it's very likely venous because the blood is deoxygenated. Yeah, I'm never gonna look at my red tools the same. I know when I was injured, I was so scared to look at it. And I think after hearing this, if there is a next time, let's hope there's not, uh, I'll feel a lot more confident looking at it. So now that we've assessed it, how do we stop that bleeding? Remember the joke goes, like all bleeding stops eventually, right? I'm sure you've <laughs> heard that one before. So if we have something relatively minor, we want to get it cleaned up, a little soap and water. It's going to hurt. So try and get it clean with as much soap and water as you can and get it covered with something clean. It doesn't have to be uh, any magical chemicals just pressure and a, a paper towel or preferably a sterile gauze or something to stop the bleeding and then sit down, preferably in a chair, not a stool that you can fall off of, but like in a chair that you're not gonna fall out of in case you sort of get dizzy or anything. And then just deep breaths. Don't hyperventilate, just trying to kind of slow yourself down so you can really think as clearly as possible. The thing that I really want to educate everyone on and whether you're having a minor injury or a moderate injury or even a severe injury, when you apply pressure, you leave that on there for a minimum of five minutes and don't take it off. Because every time you have cut yourself and you peek to see what it's doing, you're releasing that pressure, you're pulling off that clot that your blood is now, that your body forms naturally, and you've reopened that wound again. So yes, it's going to continue to bleed again. With severe injuries, and severe injuries are bone sticking out, loss of appendages, loss of digits. I have seen plenty of circular saw go across the wrist um, and, and 
that is just a devastating injury. I've seen uh, circular saws go through the thigh very easily. The first thing we need to do is grab anything around us and apply pressure as quickly as possible. I don't care if it's clean, I don't care if it's dirty, I don't care if it's a shirt off your back or off of your coworker's back, or if it is the dirty shop towel that's been sitting in the corner, grab that thing and put pressure on there and get that on there as tight as we can. Put that pressure on either with your other hand or perhaps with an ace bandage or a, a coban wrap, something that puts pressure on there and you leave it for a minimum of five minutes. Obviously, if you're bleeding enough that you're, you're oozing through all of the bandages, you don't have a minor injury you're going to need to seek care somehow. I took care of a, of a young man who got his arm injured and was bleeding to an, a level of bleeding that was becoming life-threatening. And so the first responders and the lifeguards that took care of him put a tourniquet on his arm. And the best thing that they did is when they put that tourniquet on, they looked at their watch and they wrote in Sharpie on the patient's skin exactly what time that tourniquet went on. Because we don't wanna leave a tourniquet on maximum a couple of hours. Obviously we do them for life-saving instances. So um, I would rather say, you've heard the phrase life over limb, but I would like to save the limb if possible. Although needing a tourniquet is very rare, it, it is a good idea to have one around as unfortunately accidents happen and we're trying to be as prepared as we can for them. So the point is a tourniquet should only be used in life-threatening situations and you should never take it off unless you're with a medical professional. Now, John, how do I use a tourniquet? The first thing that I want you to keep in mind is if you do have a tourniquet in your shop, it's probably brand new sealed in the package already, which if you have an injury so significant that you need a tourniquet, the chances of you being able to get it out of the plastic are going to be almost impossible. That's unbelievable. <laughs> I've had this for two years. It's been in my first aid kit and I've never thought about that. I've opened my tourniquet and it, as you can see, it's not even through the buckle. H how should I store it so that I, if I need it, it's ready to go? I like to store mine so that it's ready to go immediately because whenever you need one, you need one immediately. So I have mine already threaded through the buckle, just like any other buckle, nothing fancy there. And I make sure that I have a tab on the bottom that I can easily grab that and it's very open. So I can easily I can fit my arm through here. I can fit my foot or on my leg through here. And since I have that tab on the bottom ready to go, if I need to put that on my arm, I can just put that here, pull that right through and get that put on just like that. Do you put the tourniquet as close to the injury as you can? The best place to put the tourniquet is in the middle of whatever part that you need to put it on. So. For example, if you have a, a, an injury to your wrist, you would want to put it in the middle of the forearm. If you have something in the middle or the upper part of the forearm or even at the elbow, you want to put it in the middle of your upper arm. Same with your leg. If you have an injury to your ankle, you would want to put it on your calf area. Any higher than that, you would want to put it about mid thigh. So point is, you want to keep it stored so that you can fit any part of your body through it. And you want to put it halfway up the next part of your extremity that needs a tourniquet. So with a major injury, we just gotta get pressure on it right away, whatever's handy. But with a minor or moderate injury, it's super important to clean it. What's the best way to do that to prevent infection? Unfortunately, none of our shops are very clean. Certainly not as clean as an operating room or even as clean as cutting yourself with a razor or an X-Acto knife or something sharp like that. A good thing to do would be soap and water. Uh, and that's gonna, number one, get any grease, dirt, sawdust, uh, oil out of the wound, but it's also gonna give you an opportunity to look at it. You know, you don't want to let the wound um, kind of get really, really wet. You wanna let it dry out eventually and let it air out a little bit and hopefully scab over depending on the type of the wound. But yeah, I just wanna keep it clean and keep changing uh, dressings um, over the next few days. Usually we use the antibiotic ointment for stuff that is either at risk for getting infected or we can't get the wound to close on its own. Maybe a glancing blow with a chisel or something where you kind of take a chunk off your knuckle or something. And especially skin that's moving a lot where healing get, keeps getting pulled apart. You know, you clench your fist and the crack opens up. But if we are not able to get out any contaminant, we're only increasing the chance of infection. And it can take weeks, if not months, for that infection to really show us where it's at and what it's doing. So wounds that are getting more red and more tender are ones that are at risk for infection. Definitely more swollen over time. 
We, we obviously expect more swelling right away in the first couple hours, but swelling that gets worse over the over five days is something that would be risky for infection. If the swelling is not just where the trauma happens, so you know you have a fingertip injury, but the whole finger is swollen like a sausage, that's an infection. That's some incredible information. And a lot of things I didn't know, I really had some sort of epiphany moments there, especially about the tourniquet. Now, one of the issues about going to the hospital is there's a lot of people that are dedicated to your care in from the time that you're in your shop and somebody comes and picks you up going through intake through you know the nurses physicians assistants surgeons you want to give these people the right information to give you the best chance of success at a full recovery so guys what can i do to prepare for my trip to the hospital you know, we are the eyes and ears of the emergency department out in the field. So we want to gather information. Not only do we kind of stay, try to stabilize people, but we need to be kind of detectives to figure out things. We want to gather information. You want to get, you know, it's so convenient for everybody. If uh, a helper would just write down on a piece of paper, their name, their date of birth, any history, medical history they may have, any allergies to medications they have, and then a current list of medications. Those might even be great things to keep on a card in your wallet or something. Yeah, so the questions that you're gonna get asked are all the things that are so critical for, for anybody in medicine. We don't wanna make decisions that are gonna put someone at risk. And so it's really important that we understand what else is going on in your body? Yeah, you got a finger injury now, but did you have a pacemaker put in three weeks ago and you're on a blood thinner? or are you taking a medicine that makes it unsafe to do anesthesia in a certain way? Do you have a previous shop injury and you have a piece of metal in your arm and we can't get an MRI safely? Like those are important things to know so we don't cause a worse problem than you've already got going on. I've heard that it's hard to reattach something. Is that true? And how can I best improve my chances to like reattach a finger if I chop it off? So number one, that's a hospital trip no joke about it and that's a quick hospital trip because the clock is ticking number two obviously we want to get the body part the finger or the fingertip and bring it with you believe it or not they can do amazing things about reattaching uh, cut off fingers hands whatnot so you do want to keep those parts um, you don't put them directly on ice you just put them in like a ziploc bag and then you keep them cool and a lot of people don't have a shop right outside their kitchen or by an ice maker so a good option for that would be a couple of the instant ice packs that you can get on Amazon or drugstore and have those available so you can just pop them and crush them up. They get very cold. Let's say it's a finger. To take the amputated finger and to wrap it in a moist paper towel, nothing fancy. If you have sterile gauze, great. If not, that's fine. Put that in a Ziploc bag. Then take a large zip top bag Fill it with ice and water, so you get a water bath that's ice cold, and then put the finger inside the first bag inside that water bath. Um, and so it's just gonna submerge the finger inside a Ziploc bag inside ice water. What's the time difference between warm and cold? Ischemia is when a, a body part doesn't have a blood supply. So warm ischemia, body temperature, but no blood supply, we're looking at maximum six hours and the longer it is, the worse it is. So we definitely don't want to, to say, to meet someone at five hours and 55 minutes and find out that they've been holding their finger in the palm of their hand and it's warm the whole time. Cold ischemia time, just like the freezer, just like cryopreservation, it slows every, everything down. So the cells that are breaking down oxygen, creating waste products, all that's happening slower. So it buys you more time. There's not really a, a cutoff of exactly, you know, nine hours and 14 minutes. Sooner is always better. I think that was some of the most valuable information I've ever learned as uh, somebody who makes stuff for a living. We continued to talk at length about first aid kits, what you need, first aid treatment, tips and tricks. I wanted to share that information with you. It was so in depth with those guys, I wanted to give you the consensus on what we agreed on should definitely be in a first aid kit, as well as some optional items that are really useful. I think one of the most important things is maintaining these supplies. You, you know, some things in your first aid kit have expiration dates or they can go bad. And it's important to make sure that once a year you go through and update the things you need and make sure the things that you've used get replaced. So let's go through uh, the must haves and the optionals uh, and why they're important. And I'm also going to tell you some tips and tricks about 
treating some minor injuries. All right, I have everything separated into must-haves and some really great additions that I love and the guys recommended. Uh, all this stuff will be linked down below. Uh, you'll see it's very inexpensive and you're not supporting Jeff Bezos, which is great, small business baby. Here is a 3M kit that I love. Since my thumb injury, I had one of these in the shop, I now have eight. We have them everywhere. You know, I have five guys working in here and so it's important that we have all the stuff for any occasion. What I love about this kit is it has the ice packs, which I know James and the other guys talked about is phenomenal, not only to reduce swelling, but in case you have an amputation. One thing that no first aid kit has that you need to add is a couple Ziploc bags, maybe more than two, in case you do have an amputation. Uh, what's great about this kit is it's got one of those uh, pop ice bags that you squeeze and it gets cold. So you can put it in the outer bag with water and that's gonna give it that cold bath without soaking a finger or a hand in water. Maybe get some bigger Ziploc bags than these, like the gallon ones. Obviously, a tourniquet. Now, like we talked about, a tourniquet you may never need, um, but it's if you need it, you need it. So it's important to have it and it's important to open it up. Don't be like me and leave yours in plastic for two years. It's important to open it up like John talked about and make sure it's ready to go in case you don't have use of one of your extremities. One thing that maybe isn't necessary, but I consider it necessary, I keep about, I don't know, a dozen rolls of these on hand at the shop because it's so useful for minor wounds. This stuff is pretty waterproof. I think I, I learned it was called vet tape in the beginning, but medical professionals call it Coban. It seals to itself with heat, so you can just wrap it around a Band-Aid on your finger. Uh, don't wrap it too tight, because it does get a little tighter once it heats up. And then you just rub it, and it stays on, and you can work all day. It's really, really flexible and stretchy, so uh, not only will it keep your Band-Aid on, but it'll keep your cut clean and dry all day, and you don't have to worry about every time you bend your knuckle, your Band-Aid pops off. So I consider this stuff absolutely necessary. It's super cheap. I think a buck 99 for these big rolls. You really want a good set of tweezers. I don't think I've ever seen a first aid kit that came with great tweezers unless it was really expensive. Super glue is great. You know, John was telling me about a great tip that he uses where if he gets a splinter, he'll put a little super glue on it, let it completely dry, and then he picks the super glue and it just pops right off. One trick that I have uh, that I always use is I'll take the end of a pair of tweezers and stick it in the hole gentlemen, ladies, where the splinter went in and just popped the skin above it, that usually pops out, or you could use a needle to do it. These are great, definitely not necessary, but I will link them down below because they're really good waterproof, big dressings. It only comes in a five pack, but they're great because they're nice and big. So you could put that over, you know, a Band-Aid or a dressing you have if you need to wash your hands regularly. And then one thing that John was certainly a huge proponent of. Uh, and James and Cormac as well was butterfly strips. These sterile, stretchy strips are great. Um, these aren't the traditional butterfly shape, but you could cut them to length and use a bunch of them. There's a ton in here, and I think it's, again, like a buck or two. Uh, those are really, really good stuff. So that's stuff you should definitely have or maybe should have in your shop. Again, go through your first aid kit. Open it up, don't wait. Find where the things are before you need them. You know, we got gloves in here, triangle bandage for a sling. You know, you got sterile gauze, burn cream, antibiotic ointment, band-aids, tape. There's uh, some cheap scissors and tweezers in here. Uh, what I love about these is they even has a wall bracket so you can hang it on the wall of your shop. So it's bright red, visible, you know where it is. And those are, are some of the things that you definitely should have, not only for trauma, but also for first aid. So just so you know that I'm not BSing, this is just the Coban or vet tape that I keep in the, the woodworking shop. We have a bunch more over in the manufacturing and shipping department, but I love that stuff. I use it on every wound over my Band-Aids. Primo. Guys, I, you know, usually when I do a video, I'm the one teaching and, you know, we go through and we do these videos, but this was the first video I've ever done where I got to learn from others. And it was a subject that I'm now so concerned about that I wasn't as much, I didn't even know I needed to be worried about it before my injury. Cause I just never thought about it. I thought you'd be safe. And then if you get hurt, you go to the hospital. I didn't realize what happens to the body with that flight or fight response and sort of how your brain just sort of stops working. So now, I feel like one, I never wanna get injured again, but two, if the unthinkable happens, I'm gonna be ready. And that's, that's worth more than anything I think I've ever learned. So uh, I feel like I got a lot out of this and I hope you did too. Uh, if you wanna support the channel, head over to the Cat's Moses store, pick up a dovetail jig, a stop block, or an apron. Check out the products I linked below. Uh, support's a great business and uh, it really is very necessary for you to have in the shop. Guys, stay safe. 
Have a wonderful day.